Um, welcome to this presentation, where we'll be talking about uh, Airflow extensions uh, that we built uh, in Atchin for uh, streamlining ETL backfills. Um, in this presentation, we'll talk about some of the challenges that we faced uh, for backfilling and some of the solutions that we developed to solve these uh, solve for these challenges. My name is Ravi. Um, I'm a data engineer at Atchin, uh, working in the core data infrastructure team. Uh, I'm slightly light skinned, um, and I am. I'm currently wearing my uh, Atchin hoodie, calling from my home office based in the Netherlands. Um, in the background, you can see my uh, reading chair uh, and my bird plushie. And uh, joining me in this call is uh, Jorik. Hello, I'm Jorik, also a data engineer in the core data infrastructure team at Agem. Uh, I'm a, long, a light brown skinned individual, uh, medium long hair, and I'm wearing a, a red polo today. Uh, in the background, you can also see my home office uh, with a big black closet there. Um, yeah, that was uh, the introduction. Let's go uh, on to the introduction of Agen. Uh, Agen is a company that was founded in 2006 in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Um, and basically, as it says on the screen, we provide a single payment platform globally to accept payments and grow revenue online on mobile and at the point of sale. That means we do everything with payments on a business, business to business uh, side. So we're not a bank for individuals. Uh, and to give you a sense of, uh, of scale, we're working with million, millions of payments a day. Uh, here you can see some of our merchants that we are working with in the tech industry. Uh, as you can see, we're uh, mostly focused on uh, large cap companies. All right, then on to the workflow of the big data platform. Uh, first, uh, the first thing that you should know about us is that we are working fully on premise. Uh, this is mostly due to the financial regulations. Uh, and that means that we have all the servers in house and that we manage everything from the hardware to the software. And of course, we have different clusters. Uh, we have a separate cluster as a sandbox, and we have a beta test and a live cluster. Uh, next to that, we have weekly releases. Each week, we start with a new release on Tuesday on beta. And two days later, we release to test. And finally, the week after, if everything goes well, we release to live. And also, uh, we are made out of teams, of course. Uh, we have 20 plus teams on the big data platform currently, and more than 100 data scientists. And these data scientists and their teams are responsible for their own DAGs, but more will follow on that later from Ravi. Then our Airflow cluster setup at Agen. Uh, we migrated to Airflow 2.0 uh, a month ago. Uh, it's been quite a smooth uh, sailing from there. Um, as we said, as I said, we are on premise, so we are not using containers yet, and therefore we're using the salary workers. Uh, next to that, we have a large yarn queue for Spark jobs, and Airflow is backed up by a Postgres database. What we're mostly be talking about today is the Agen extensions that we have up on the Airflow platform. So that is operators, hooks, but also some listeners or database events. Um, and the models and the views that are uh, specified in a plugin. And interesting to know is actually that Airflow, uh, the Airflow upgrade from 1.10 to 2.0 uh, was very smooth. And also for this plugin, we actually had to make minimal changes uh, to make it work with Airflow 2. So uh, that shows the extensibility uh, or extendability of Airflow. Yeah, thanks uh, Thanks for the introduction, Jorik. Uh, so at, at, um, at Atchin, we use Airflow quite a lot. Here I, uh, I de depicted four of the teams at Atchin. At the center, you can see the core data infrastructure team uh, that provides all the raw payment data uh, and the configuration data for our uh, for our platform and to our teams. Um, then these uh, product teams they use this data to create value. And uh, and actually we are a really strong believer of uh, data as a product, which means that these teams are fully responsible um, for the development cycle of their data product. Um, this means that they own all the tables and the DAGs that they create uh, um, for those tables. Um, also uh, worth noting is that these uh, product teams, the three product, product teams I listed here, uh, writ uh, have written fantastic blog posts about their product. So be sure to check that out on the link uh, in the top right. Um, but of course, these aren't the only three um, uh, product teams uh, at Agen. Um, 
uh, there are many others, uh, of course, as Yorick mentioned. Um, but what the tricky part uh, is that these uh, product teams also have data dependencies within each other. And this gives uh, rise to some nice challenges that I'll discuss in the next couple of slides. Um, just to make these challenges a little bit more concrete, I drew a, um, a small uh, ETL pipeline as an example. Uh, so here you can see from the left to right a table one that has some downstream dependencies for table two and table three, table four, uh, which in turn has some downstream dependencies on table five and six. Um, what's also pretty common at Atchin is that these tables are generated through different DAG. So here I drew them out with DAG A, DAG B, and DAG C. Um, also, uh, you can also have different uh, scheduling uh, intervals for these DAG. So here you can see DAG A and DAG B on a daily schedule and DAG C on a weekly schedule. Um, and finally, these DAGs can also be owned by different teams. Here you can see DAG A and DAG B owned by team alpha and DAG C being owned by team uh, beta. Um, so this works in a happy flow uh, quite well. Um, but every so often we need to trigger a backfill for one of the tables, let's say table three for a for example, a full month in June. Um, this can be due to people iterating on table three or just because of a blip in the universe, we have uh, corrupted data in, uh, in table three. Um, but of course, the problem doesn't stop there because if you backfill table three, you also need to backfill table four in the same DAG and table five and six in DAG C. Um, and this is basically the core of the problem because uh, this is what we set out to solve. Uh, in practice, this becomes really tedious uh, operation with lots of manual work. Um, and in this simple and cute example, uh, it's still manageable. But if we start considering the scale at which you work at Atchin, um, it, it gets a little bit more complicated. So again, we have 20 different product teams with over 100 contributors. Um, we work with tens of millions of payments on a daily basis that make their way to 500 um, ingested and aggregated tables. Uh, and all of these tables are managed through almost 150 Airflow DAGs. So that's just to give you a little bit of a sense of the scale uh, at which we need to do backfilling. Um, so it's clear that we need to streamline these backfills. Um, but more concretely, what do we need to solve? So the first things first, we need sort of solid dependency management. Um, that means we need to be able to resolve downstream dependencies inside the DAG that the table is in, but also uh, external dependencies that we have uh, in, uh, uh, in other DAGs. Next, we need reliable state updates. In our case, we'll, we need to um, clear the airflow task instances. We also need to clear the Hive uh, Metasore partitions uh, associated to those uh, tables. Um, and also we need to delete the data from HDFS since we have externally managed Hive tables. Uh, and finally, we need to consider the heterogeneous nature of our DAGs and tasks, meaning that some of the DAGs can have different scheduling strategies, different start and end dates, and also tasks that have different write modes. Um, so to solve these, these problems, we came up with a solution uh, with the very original and descriptive name uh, called undo DAG. Um, but before I jump into what undo DAG is, I need to talk about building uh, a core building block of the undo DAG, which is the ETL source operator. Uh, and this is also the first extension that we built. Uh, this is one of the first extensions that we built uh, for Airflow. Um, so the undo DAG is, uh, sort of starts out at the Spark submit operator, which just helps us create a, a simple Spark job uh, that we submit to our uh, to Yarn. Um, we extended the Spark submit operator with our own, uh, with uh, something called the Agent Spark submit operator, which contains some logic and some um, uh, some logic and some tools for logging and configuration management. Uh, and top of the Agent Spark submit operator, we have the ETL source operator, which is simply just um, some uh, sugar coding that helps us store ETL's uh, specific information uh, on the tables. Um, and also helps us resolve some dependencies uh, that contains and that, that logic is contained within the ETL source operator. Um, and as a code snippet here, you can see table three and table four being generated um, with the ETL source operator. Uh, it contains information on the Hive databases. Um, it also has a cre table creation function that generates a table and also the write mode for this table. Um, and then at the end, you can see the airflow syntax for the dependency. 
Um, so in essence, all of these tables I drew out in the previous example are actually just ETL social operators generating these um, uh, these tables, and uh, and also the dependencies are managed uh, through the ETL social operator. So the only thing that we need to do with the undo DAG is to use the capabilities of the ETL source operator to map out all of the dependencies. Uh, but of course, it doesn't only stop there because after we resolve the dependencies, um, we need to start the full uh, uh, undo DAG procedure. Um, and the second step would be to pause all the affected DAGs that are uh, that contain the tables within them. After that, we can clear the Hive Meta Store clear the Spark warehouse, uh, meaning the, the actual data on the HDFS, but also clear the Airflow task instances. And after we've done that, then we can unpause all of the affected DAGs. Um, so that's, that's all theory so far, but let's just see this exact same example inside a demo. So we'll be clearing table three in, in our demo. Um, here you can see a video, hopefully. Uh, yeah, so on the screen, you can see all the three DAGs that we were talking about in our example, the owners and the schedule interval at which they run. On the top, you can see an extra tab that we introduced called the duty tab with a lot of different views in there. Uh, each of these views deserve their own uh, presentation, but for now, let's just focus on the undo DAG view. Um, and once we open the undo DAG view, you are greeted with this warm welcome saying that all of the operations are uh, cannot be undone with all of the previous logs on the left side. Uh, then we'll feed in the parameters for our new run or our new undo. Uh, we'll clear the full month of June. Um, so we can feed in the start and the end date here. Uh, after that, we'll select table three that we want to be clearing from DAGB, approved by Yorick in this case, uh, and a Utrecht ticket explaining the reason why we need to clear this. So to clear the airflow task instances, the Spark warehouse, will undo the downstreams inside the DAG and also the external to the DAG. And then you are uh, see, you can see this big summary of the tables that we are clearing and the DAGs. Um, you can also see the sensor there, but uh, Jorik will explain that in a second. Um, and after we click OK, the operation is submitted. Uh, and after the, uh, after the operation is complete, you can see the parameters uh, for the run. You can see that we clear the Airflow task instances first. Uh, after clearing it, you can see we pause all of the affected DAGs, DAG B and DAG C. After that, we are we continue with clearing the uh, partitions on HDFS. Uh, you can see the full month uh, being cleared there. And after that, we proceed to drop those partitions from the Hive Metastore. Uh, after that is complete, we repeat the same process for table four, uh, table five, and table six, as you can see here. Uh, notice that table five and table six only have four partitions removed because they are uh, running on a weekly schedule. Uh, after that is completed, we unpause all of the affected DAGs and conclude the undo DAG operation. So that was a, a small demo of the undo DAG, a simple demo. But um, during the demo, I, uh, I we skipped a little bit of the uh, implementation details, like for example, how we keep track of partitions and how we even detect these external dependencies. And luckily we have Yorick that will help us dive a bit deeper in that. All right, so how do we keep track of data? Um, one of the examples that you see are on the right is that we have a table four and uh, originally it's in DAG B, but it could very well be that for some reason we want to move this task around because it's from another stream, so it should be in another DAG, for example. Uh, and we want to move this task uh, or this table four from DAG B to DAG D. In that case, we would lose all the progress that it's made and we wouldn't know which tasks uh, for which days would be executed and which ones wouldn't. Um, that's one of the problems. Another problem would still be that uh, triggering the task would be uh, triggering a task manually in the web, uh, web interface means we could rerun a task and thereby also create duplicate data. Uh, and finally, what also happened sometimes was that uh, even though uh, we had the task instances, we would sometimes need to delete data that we don't need anymore. And then the, um, there would be inconsistencies between the task instances and the actual data partitions on HDFS. In order to solve this, 
uh, we, yeah, we keep track of the data partitions with the IGN markers. Uh, the setup is relatively simple. It's just a model, uh, which is very similar to a task instance model. And we created a minor view to also show all the IGN markers that are there. And instead of referencing to a task, we reference to a table. So uh, if the task moves around, that doesn't matter because we are still uh, referencing the same table. Um, next slide, please. Then the run of an ETL source operator. The ETL source operator, uh, after a successful run, we write an IGN uh, marker. And only when we delete the actual data partition, then the marker is removed. And if we, uh, at the start of a run, we check if the marker is already present for that day. And if it is present, then we skip that task. So thereby it prevents having uh, or running the same task twice and creating duplicate data. And finally, so if we split a DAG, or I should say, if we move the task around, what we could do is let the task backfill from uh, any specific date in the past, and it will automatically skip all the runs that it has already done. And thereby, if the stream wants to do an undo DAG operation, it's still able to actually clear all these task instances that were skipped, remove the underlying data, and that's all done within the undo DAG view. And then Airflow will automatically catch up and uh, run rerun all the tasks and re-ingest this data. Um, yeah, in the undo DAG, as uh, Ravi already mentioned, uh, we need to keep track between uh, the dependencies between the tables. So in the case uh, we have here is that table four needs to execute before table five and six uh, can be executed. And that's done via custom sensors. Uh, it's in, uh, in its base, very similar to an external task sensor, but we extended it a little bit uh, because we wanted to have the possibility to sense for multiple task instances over a specific period. So for example, DAG C is set on a weekly period, while DAG B is set on a daily period. And for DAG C to start, we want uh, seven runs of DAG B to be successful. Furthermore, we also wanted to have that functionality for a month, but for a month, it becomes a little bit more complex because sometimes a month has 28 days, sometimes it has 30 days or 31 days. Um, so that's something we wanted to solve. And uh, we also wanted to sense based on the Achen markers if we notice that it's an ETL source operator. And on the right side, you can see, uh, a little bit of code, how we would define such a sensor. At the top, you can see the definition of DAG C. And right below that, you can see the definition of our uh, sensor for table four. Uh, in this case, it's an append table sensor. And you define the DAG ID and the task ID uh, in the sensor. And at the bottom, you can see the dependency where the sensor of table four has to succeed before we continue to table five and six. So uh, yeah, creating our, our own sensor. Uh, first of all, we uh, changed the time period. So the time period is the amount of time you want to look back in time. And for this, we use a relative delta. And thereby, it automatically resolves uh, how many days, for example, there are in a month. Uh, and it makes it a little bit easier to work with. So the next thing is the number of successes. Based on this time period and the, uh, the schedule interval of the other DAG, we check how many days or how many runs in that specific time period we should have. And we actually check that those number of runs uh, are in there. And only if you are in there, we succeed the sensor. And finally, uh, we made the sensor support markers in such a way that uh, uh, we check whether the task we're sensing is an ETL source operator. And if it is an ETL source operator, it does the queries on the marker model. And if it's not an ETL source operator, it falls back to the default task instances model. All right. Uh, then a little summary of uh, what we covered today. 
So first of all, uh, we cover the ETL source operator, which contains all the logic of how we store a Spark data frame into a table and allows for the undo DAG view to figure out all the dependencies. Uh, also the undo DAG view, so where the undo DAG view starts out by figuring out the dependencies uh, and follow, following is uh, pausing all the DAGs, then removing all the data from Spark and updating Hive uh, sorry, from the HDFS Hadoop file system and from updating the Hive Metastore and finally unpauses all the DAGs. Then the Adgen markers, it reduces the manual errors that we were seeing and um, gave us a better sense of what partitions were on the cluster. And finally, the Adgen sensors, which allowed us to specify cross DAG dependencies and added support for Adgen markers. Uh, and this, in the end, allowed us to streamline the backfilling and a lot and reduce the amount of manual work that was required. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Uh, OK. I see uh, here that we uh, haven't have we don't have any questions yet. So uh, if you do have any questions, uh, please send them 